Uh, it's a true honor and pleasure to be here today. And uh, before I go into the topic of this presentation, I would like to tell you why I am here today. And this is uh, when I first had the privilege to meet uh, Giovanni. This was at the meeting in Sardinia many years ago. I had the pleasure to meet uh, Professor Alfredo Margaret at the same time, Romeo Betto, the members of the group. Stefano Scafina was there as well. At that time, I was too shy to talk to him, but I had many questions. I'm not shy any longer, but uh, so, and uh, this led to long-standing collaboration. And Giovanni has been the most important mentor for me ever, really. And what he taught me is what we're doing today as well. It's a reflection of uh, what he learned, taught me. And at that time, we had a mutual interest in aging. And uh, we were working in a rat model at that time, the Kugel by Edstrom model. Uh, it, uh, it's a model to visualize and look at the contractor properties of single motor units. Uh, this was a model introduced, we first described the visual representation of the motor unit in the muscle. This was in the late 60s. This is Kugel by a young man. And as his young student at that time, uh, Lars Edström, not so young here, but uh, they visualized the single motor units, and we looked at the aging and later change of the muscle, the spatial organization, expression of pro contractor proteins, and also on contractor properties. And one of the findings was the slowing of the isometric twitch, independent if it was a fast or a slow twitch. And this is when I was uh, approaching Giovanni as well. I more or less invited myself here to, uh, to part of, I have to say, to give a presentation, and Step by step, I came closer and closer into the center of the, of the lab, and they never get rid of me after that, I can tell. So I've, I've been coming here for almost every year, for now since the mid-80s, really. So it's, um, you can never stop me to come here, really. It's, it's always been a privilege to come here, and it's very much to thanks to Giovanni Salviato. Then. And at that time, uh, Dr. Di Mauro showed us this, the skin fiber preparation, membrane permeabilized cells with the so-called plasmic reticulum still intact. And what is the primary determinant that determines the, the, this, uh, the speed of the isometric twitch is calcium handling by the so-called plasmic reticulum. So I did our experiments in Sweden. I brought the muscles here, and we used this model to look on calcium uptake activity by the so-called plasmic reticulum. And we could at least then explain some of the changes in the isometric twitch by changing in the, in the calcium uptake activity by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. At that time, Giovanni has also introduced a technique to detect car uh, malign carriers of malignant hyperthermia. Uh, it was a superior model to use at that time. I don't think it has ever really hit, but it's a fantastic model, really, where you look on calcium sensitivity of sarcoplasmic re uh, uh, release in single muscle cells. And Giovanni at that time was using open biopsies from humans, and I saw this, and for me this was a real eye-opener, I can tell you, because I thought maybe this could be a way to come back and look on regulation of human muscle contraction under controlled condition at the single cell level. Uh, Giovanni was open, using open biopsies. I've always been taught to use the small biopsies we get from percutaneous biopsies. They're long enough to do biochemistry, morphology, EM, etc. And we'd like to scale it down to also look on regulation of muscle contraction in single short muscle cells that we get with a percutaneous muscle biopsy. And I set up uh, Giovanni's technique in, in Sweden, and certainly human fibers work really well. But also, Giovanni guided me to go to Rick Moss' lab and see what they're doing. Because Rick has set up a method to look on very short muscle cell segments, attached short cell, cell segments. And I was fortunate to spend a year there. And this is a human muscle cell connected between a force transducer and servo motor. We can then look on the contractor properties in single muscle cells, solubilize them, and look at my fibrillar protein expression. And this, for me, was a way to come back to look at human muscle. I gave up human muscle research because I think we could just find a lot of cor correlation, but we could never understand underlying mechanisms. So going back to the cellular uh, level, level, though, this was possible. So, and this has sort of had a strong impact on what the story I will tell you uh, from now on. And that is the acquired myopathies in intensive care unit patients. The critical illness myopathy and the ventilator-induced diaphragmic muscle dysfunction. And I see these patients on a weekly basis. And we try to understand mechanisms. 
improve the diagnosis and monitoring, and also try to introduce the interventions. I will skip the monitoring here, but I think to sort of focus more on mechanism and interventions. Many of you have heard of this before, so I think I'll skip through quite quickly in the, in the beginning and go to what we sort of knew at the end of this presentation. Then. So why is this important? Uh, this is what we're going through in Stockholm right now. It's kind of a painful process. Uh, we're moving from the old hospital to the new one. And in new university hospital, hospital beds are decreasing in number, but what is increasing are ICU beds. That used to be just a small fraction, but are expected to be almost a third of all uh, modern hospital beds by 2020. And the reason for this is, of course, it's improved technology, improved understanding, but not, not the least in the introduction of evidence-based medicine in intensive care, removing interventions that have been more harmful than helpful to the patient. Really. So survival has improved dramatically. And with this also comes uh, uh, the effects of life-saving interventions that also have negative effects on, on, the, on the subject of, or the patients. And uh, this is just the first description that I know of a patient with this critical illness myopathy. A young woman with a status asthmaticus attack that came to the emergency room, could not be cured, was transferred to the ICU where she was giving massive doses of steroids and also hooked up to the ventilator to ensure oxygenation of the central nervous system. And uh, she was also giving massive doses with steroids then. And then when uh, infection was cured and weaning started from the ventilator, it was found that she was quadriplegic. She couldn't move any muscles from here and down. She had intact cognitive function and intact sensory function. And what was considered at that time to be the uh, triggering factors were, non were neuromuscular blockers, steroids, and sepsis. I don't think any one of them are really important triggering factors, but that was, what the, was the consensus at that time. I heard about this the first time when George Carpote from Montreal Neurological Center came to our hospital. And he was on, going on a tour and he came to our lab. And at that time I had his single cells from human cells up in the lab. You could see the fiber on the screen. We could activate it. And they said, wow, this would have been a perfect technique to the study the patient I just saw. And he did something no one else had done before. He took a muscle biopsy and did electron, mic electron microscopy. And there was no A-band in the sarcomere. There was no contractor protein. So it was not so surprising the patient was uh, paralyzed. And these patients have been diagnosed as acquired neuropathies, polyneuropathies, called critical illness neuropathy, which is an entity, but much less common than the primary myopathy. And at least I didn't forget about this. I was co on call Christmas 95 and another hospital in Stockholm, I was asked to do, go there and do our electrophysiological tricks in an in a elderly woman that had an acquired uh, quadriplegia. And the electrophysiology indicates uh, selective motor axonopathy, but that's actually because we're misinterpreting electrophysiological signals. I took a biopsy, went back to the lab, you have a control subject on the cell under relaxing condition, maximum activating condition, and this is the fiber from the patient. And as you can see, uh, there's something wrong with these muscle cells. They do, don't develop any force uh, upon maximum calcium activation. And we solubilize them. We have the three myosin heavy chain isoforms expressed in human muscle, two fast and one slow. We see no myosin heavy chain here in single cells. But these are also atrophic fibers. We loaded bundles of 10 to 20 fibers, still no myosin. And when we run it on another gel system, we can also look at smaller proteins. One, two, and three here is for a patient with a hemiplegia due to a central lesion. On the paretic and non paretic side, there's a full expression of thick filament proteins, but none of them are expressed in the patient plan. But thin filament proteins are there, like actin, tropomyosin, etc. So after finding this first patient, just by looking around in ICUs, we found 10 patients in no time. And now we see almost one patient a week in our hospital, and that's still an underestimation, I would say. And this is EM showing the same thing, C lines, no A band. This is the control, we see a normal uh, muscle then. And I, at that time, I was almost not shy any longer, so I contacted Stefano Schiaffino, who did the in situ hybridization. And uh, then you can see, uh, he could then show that was a full, uh, in this instance, there was a full transcript for, uh, C, uh, for actin, but not for myosin, and there was no protein, more or less, when you do the immunocytochemistry. Unfortunately, this patient later died during recovery. And later on, we looked at another man, uh, same thing, uh, actin transcript, but not formicin. But there is some protein here, but he was still paralyzed. 
And these cells develop some force upon maximum calcium activation, but much lower than normal, and there's less protein. And this also tells us there's also another mechanism underlying the paralysis, and that is actually a less excitable muscle membrane. And that's why the electrophysiology has been misinterpreted in the past. And this is after full recovery about half a year later. We have a full expression of the transcript and also of the protein. And this is just showing recovery of force, uh, recovery of structure, and the re-expression of contractile proteins. The problem, of course, ICU patients are not the homogeneous population. So we moved into an experimental animal model to try to understand this better. And we started with the pig model and exposed them to what we thought were the triggering factors at that time, neuromuscular blockers, corticosteroids, and sepsis alone or combined. And this is experiments, I should say, they're only for five days. And five days is too short to induce the phenotype in these critical illness myopathy patients. But a lot of the things are happening here, though. In five days, we don't see muscle atrophy. And in pigs just exposed to neuromuscular blockers to mechanical ventilation, we don't see a change in specific force either. Force normalized the cross-section area. But when you start adding uh, corticosteroids and sepsis, force generating co uh, capacity is compromised. And then with the help of Eric Hoffman, we use gene array then to look at the gene expression. And in pigs, where we see no change in structure and function, I think 1,475 genes went up and down significantly, which could be a little bit surprising in one way. But there are also compensatory mechanisms. There's a reason why we don't wake up after a long night's sleep with muscle atrophy. So we could then compare those with those that there was a loss in function. And one thing that always came up were heat shock proteins. When function was compromised, heat shock proteins were downregulated. And also, as you said, craniofacial muscles are typically spared. So when we compared uh, uh, masticator muscle with limb muscles, in rats exposed to all these factors, when we see a loss in function in the limb muscle, no loss in size, in craniofacial muscles, no effect at all. Function is spared. And once again, one thing that showed up were heat shock proteins that were upregulated in craniofacial muscles. I'll come back to that as a potential intervention strategy later on. But of course, there are many other factors as well. And then the muscle that uh, anesthesiologists are really interested in, except from the heart, is the diaphragm. Because this is what determines how fast you can wean the patient from the ventilated diaphragm muscle function. Open bars here are specific force in different cell times. And here the colors, you can skip the really which, what it represents, but it shows independent on type of intervention, there's a loss in function. So the common denominator here is mechanical ventilation. It doesn't matter if you add sepsis or whatever. So the mechanical ventilation is doing something to the diaphragm. I'll come back to that in a second. The problem is five days, both in the, in the pig and in the patient, is too short to induce the, the phenotype with the preferential loss of myosin. So we then started in collaborating with Barry Dworkin, who developed a rodent model where you can keep a rat alive for long durations on mechanically ventilated, pharmacologically paralyzed. And the longest duration so far is 96 days. So we're not limited by early mortality with this model, which is really important if you want to do time-resolved analysis and try to understand mechanisms. It's a, it's a difficult model in many ways to put it together, uh, but most of all, it's time-consuming, so to say. So this is just showing what we monitor in these rats 24 hours per day for the whole time period. Then. So we monitor uh, carbon dioxide content and expiratory gas. This is uh, EEG, breath by breath, the pressure in the respiratory system, ECG, arterial venous blood pressure, and body temperature, and we do FFT analysis as well. So what we could then, when we follow these rats over time, we could see that they developed a genotype and a phenotype similar to what we see in the ICU patient. We thought this could be a good model to try and understand the mechanism, and hopefully later on go into interventions then. So this is for three weeks. We see the blurring of the enzyme histochemical pattern. The myosin actin ratio is decreasing. There's atrophy, not in the beginning, but later on, but the loss in, in force generating capacity. So after two, three weeks, force generating capacity is less than 10% of uh, the uh, control situation, so to say. And then, uh, this is just looking then in myosin, which is the filled bars, actin, open bars. We see a preferential loss of myosin, independent, it's a fast or slow twitch muscle. And there's a loss in the myosin-actin ratio, and also transcriptional downregulation that comes after five days. And then we also looked at the activation of the different proteolytic pathways, the ubiquitin proteasome, the calcium stimulated, and the autophagy. And they follow a specific temporal pattern, really. 
And once again, when we look on the craniofacial muscle, the masticatory muscle, we see very little myosin loss compared to uh, uh, limb muscle. Do you think we have a model here, which is, is not perfect, of course, but I think it's the best model that is out there to try to understand mechanism. So which are the mechanisms there? And this is just an anecdotal finding. It's from a young boy, a six-year-old boy waiting for a lung transplant. He was giving massive doses. Unfortunately, this is a post-mortem biopsy. And this is just my fibro ATPA staining. So these are extrafusal fibers, severely atrophic, no myosin, and these are muscle spindles. I mean, this uh, extrafusal fiber should be larger than the muscle spindle, about this size. But the intrafusal fibers, we have staining. So there's myosin. So what is the difference? Tension. Of course, they're on the, uh, on the length control. I mean, the gamma motor is firing to sense length. So we think mechanical sensation is an important factor. And one of our collaborators, Matthias Gautel, he sort of uh, named this complete mechanical silencing. No weight bearing, no internal strain related to activation of contractile proteins. So we think this is one important triggering factor, not the only one. And this is, I quote uh, Stefano, I say, this is a com complex biological system. There's more than one pathway, but me mechanical silencing we think is one important one. So we did some trivial, simple experiments. In the rat, we had a servo motor driving in the ankle joint 12 hours per day, 13 times per, uh, per minute. And we did the same things in, in the clinic as well. And just by this simple mechanical loading in a pharmacologically paralyzed animal, we could spare muscle weight. There was a, a difference on the loaded versus the unloaded side in muscle fiber size and force generating capacity. And in the, in the humans, we tried to monitor, and also actually in the slow muscle, there was also a small effect on uh, decreasing the myosin loss. In humans, we didn't see any change in size, at the, uh, neither with ultrasound or at the single cell level, but an improved force generating capacity there. So, and also uh, together with uh, Leonardo Sal uh, no, sorry, this is with Marco Sandri, we then looked on proteolytic pathways. First, we thought we had an effect on these E atrogens, but we don't see that on the loaded versus the unloaded. But these e, other E3 ligases, uh, the open bars are then on the unloaded side, uh, there's a significant difference on the loaded versus the unloaded. So it also seems to affect uh, protein degradation pathways. And also together with Leonardo Salviati, look on the uh, mitochondria. There seems to be an effect both on fission fusion and, uh, and uh, mitophagy by looking at these different markers. And also on apoprotic pathways, actually. There's an increase on the cytosolic uh, cytochrome C and active caspase at the longer duration, and also these apo cytosolic apotoxic-induced factors. And together with Dennis Guthrie, we also looked at the uh, apoprotic, the apoprotic nuclei. They, we did, he looked at the IGF one, uh, expressing fibers and the necrotic fibers, and there was a significantly larger proportion of necrotic and IGF expressing fact fibers on the unloaded side. So what this means, of course, uh, which early physical therapy is a very important intervention in these patients. Not after three months to prevent joint contractures, actually going in on one day. And I think this is something that is accepted in most ICU uh, clinics today. But I'd like to come back to this muscle, which anesthesiologists are very interested in, and that's the diaphragm. 40% of the time on the ventilator is weaning. And then there's a small group of patients that stays on the ventilator for a very long duration. And these patients cost enormous amount of money. In the US, it predicted that these patients would cost about $64 billion annually just for prolonged weaning. And of course, it has many other negative effects as well. So we thought we'd also go back and take a look on the diaphragm. And here the situation is very different compared to what we see in the limb muscles. There's atrophy and there's loss in specific force but no preferential myosin loss. And actually, basically, no transcription downregulation as well. But severely compromised muscle cell function at the, motor, at the, at the muscle cell level. And uh, uh, Luisa Gorsa looked at it could see an increased amount of carbonylation. We can see an increased amount of intracellular fact, mitochondrial dysfunction. And we have also many evidence that there are actually specific myosin post translation modification. Based on X-ray diffraction analysis we did at the single cell level at Spring 8 in Japan, Raman, spectroscopy, immunoblotting, and mass spectrometry then. 
So then I mentioned in the beginning that we think that maybe heat shock proteins is done, doing something here. So finally we got hold of this chaperone co-inducer BGP15. This is a small molecule that upregulates heat shock protein 7072. It also has other effects as the membrane stabilizes, inhibits PORP1 activity, protects mitochondria, and probably has many other mechanisms, effects as well. It was actually introduced initially as a type 2 diabetes drug, and it has been in clinical trials. We tested this in these rats. These are the, the open and the filled bars here, what we showed you before. So then we test an intervention for 10 days. And we don't see any effect uh, untreated and treated, no effect on cross-sectional area, but force-generating capacity was doubled, more or less, really. So it has a strong impact on force-generating capacity in the diaphragm muscle cells. So, and we also have sort of introduced another model where we can extract myosin from single cells and look at the catalytic properties of myosin extracted from single cells by looking at the actin filaments propelled by myosin. And also more recently, also looked on the force generating capacity of myosin, uh, myosin extracted from a single human muscle cell then. And what we do see, uh, the, we see a parallel improvement in force generating capacity in the myosin with this BGP-15 treatment to the same extent that we see at the cellular level. And we can also see that the BGP-15 protects myosin from post translation modifications. Stefano Gastello, who was a postdoc in my lab, I think very interested in sumoylation. You could see that it's protected myosin from sumoylation. And by doing mass spec, we see a number of other modifications as well. Interesting thing, uh, the modifications that we see with, my, uh, with the mass spec are all in the rod region of, of the myosin, not in the catalytic domain or in the S1 head. And this is what we've seen with the aging muscle as well. Most of the modifications we see are in the rod region. Uh, and actually, I think there's a emerging evidence, actually, there's an interaction between the rod and the S1 head. And actually, that the rod may have an important impact also on regulation muscle contraction. So we think, it's, I'm not so discouraged about this any longer. And we also started trying to use another method to look at um, protein modification by using BGP-15. And with this model in the diaphragm, we can see it protects from some modifications, but not others. In the limb muscles, of course, when there's loss of myosin, because this is the primary cause of uh, uh, the impaired muscle function. But before that, we also have uh, effects that are where BGP-15 has a protective effect. So we have also, and it seems like uh, BGP-15 there also protects myosin from protein modification. That has uh, this initial negative effects on force generating capacity prior to the myosin loss. And, uh, and uh, here you see the, um, Controls, this is the average Raman spectrum over the, this whole spectrum in the controls and with the treated, and they're almost the same and untreated. You see there's a lot of modifications. I always had the impression uh, that survival was, was improved in this BGP-15 treated animals. And these are experiments that are going on for many, many years. And we put it all together, I was very surprised. We have 100% survival in these BGP-15 treated animals. Uh, it's not a survival study, but we do them for five, eight, or 10 days. But in 10 days without the intervention, it's about 80% uh, mortality. So this drug is doing something we think is quite important. And our goal is now actually also to introduce this into the clinic. So what is the mechanism? Is it heat shock protein or is it something else? Others have shown in the diaphragm that we can also see that this jack that pathway is upregulated in response to this ICU condition. And one of the uh, triggers for this uh, pathway is the IL-6. And we have done some, this is just pilot data, I'll sorry, and this, I will wrap up this in just a second now. So when we look in, and this is Fisher 344 Brown Norway uh, hybrid rats, and they are different from Sprague to I should say, in, ma in several different ways, really. And in, in five days, we don't see, in the young animals, the field bones, we don't see a loss in function. But in old animals, there's a dramatic loss in function, which is paralleled by when we look on the IL-6 production in adipocytes, visual adipocytes, it goes up dramatically in, in response to mechanical ventilation. But with BGP-15, it's almost normalized. And we see the loss in function that is restored almost completely with this BGP-15 and the loss in this uh, activation via the JAX that pathway by IL-6.
And finally, this is a drug, those of you working with the Schoen muscular dystrophy, we are very well aware of it. It's sort of a, it's a glucocorticoid steroid derivative, derivative and, uh, which has many of the anti-inflammatory effects of uh, prednisolone and dexamethasone, but supposed to have lacking several of the harsh hormonal negative effects on bone and muscle. And this is, of course, this Eric Hoffman's drug. And it also lacks some of the immunosuppressing effects of, of glucocorticosteroids. It has a similar but not identical structure than as uh, uh, prednisolone or dexamethasone. And we have tested this in the rat model. And first of all, what we can say, prednisolone doesn't have a negative effect if something it actually protects muscle. So I don't think it's an important triggering factor for this critical illness myopathy. In massive doses, of course, it has, but not in moderate uh, clinical doses. And this VBP15 has even some other beneficial effects. We look on the body weight change. The thing is that the, these uh, glucocorticoids also have a, a diuretic effect. So when we control for the fluid loss, body weight loss is significantly less when we give uh, the VBP15 of memorolone. It seems to have a small effect, uh, improved effect on the muscle weight, at least in the slow twitch. And in the slow twitch, they also protect the, from the loss in muscle fiber size and force generating capacity. In the EDL, the situation is different, and that prednisone has a severely negative effect, which we don't see with the uh, VBP15. And I think I'll skip this. Uh, and so it, it is a drug we're testing right now, and there are other drugs that are on the, in, in the pipeline. So but the most important thing that we want to do right now, we evaluate different intervention strategies. Good ones, we try. The goal is to bring them to the clinic, and BGP-15 is the one we hope will get into the clinic next year. And we try to improve diagnostics. We use this miniature biopsies, which is we get 5 to 50 milligrams, which is not for diagnostic purposes, even and not for transcriptome analysis. And what is the major focus now is really also going for the aging-related effects. The two factors that most strongly predict mortality in the ICU is old age and muscle wasting, and they're probably synergistic. So this is uh, what we're working on primarily. And I'm very grateful to our group and the funders, and not the least, all our international collaborators. Many of you are in the room here. And as I said, I never left Padova. Never in my mind, and I try to come back as often as I can. And as you can see, one of the uh, collaborators is Leonardo Salviati, Giovanni's oldest son. And we had a really good collaboration. And uh, of course, this is a sign of aging as well for me. Or maybe I try to say I was very young when I came in the first time. But uh, so I fool myself. But of course, it's, I'm very privileged to have this collaboration. So thank you very much, and thank you for your attention.